please welcome Mr. Larry McQuillian. kind of upbringing. Um, I'll just say one thing about this upbringing. Uh, you know, I, I never I never was scolded as a kid. How many of you were never scolded? Raise your hand. <laughs> really. I never was scolded. And uh, in fact, the uh, people, well, I stole $20 from my grandfather one time. Uh, I was nine years old, and uh, I, I wanted to buy this plastic airplane in the canteen. And so I, got, I stole the money, and then I uh, went and bought the plane. And unbeknownst to me, my aunt was standing right behind me. <laughs> and I, I, I bought the plane, <clears throat> and I turned around, and I see her, uh-oh. Uh uh, but she didn't say anything to me until I walked out of the building and then she said in very unaccusatory tone, um, Look, Kaya, where did you get the money for that? And I knew I was caught. So I said, well, I stole it from my grandfather. And um, she said, now get this, she said, Hmm, what do you think you should do about it? She left it up to me to decide what I should do. And I knew I was caught, and I said, well, I should uh, tell my, or take the plane back, get the $20 back, and uh, tell my papa I stole the money from him. And so I, and so she said, very matter of fact, we, okay. And so I went back there and uh, turned the plane back in, got $20. She took $20 out of her own pocket and buy, bought the plane for me. That's, uh, boy, I mean, you, you would expect to be scolded then, but no. And then I tell my grandfather <clears throat> that I stole the $20. He says, Echem na koch lakai, good boy. <laughs> You see, they were, um, they were rewarding the positive, beha uh, positive behavior. Uh, I turned the plane in, and so she buys a plane for me. And uh, I tell my papa, and what he's saying, good boy, is a good boy, you told me this. So I never stole again. 
that's kind of wisdom that our people had. And, um, you know, I, I would go out underneath the bird cliffs. <clears throat> the the Pribilof Island, it's called the Pribilof Island, a group of five islands in the middle of the Bering Sea. And I grew up on one of those islands called St. Paul, which is only 12 miles wide, or 12 miles long and five miles wide. It's a, and it had, when I was a kid, about 1.4 to 1.8 million fur seals, and two and a half million seabirds, a thousand reindeer, and 500 alien people. It was a magical place for a kid to be raised. <clears throat> and uh, I used to love to, I, I would get the freedom that very few kids have today, you know. I would, I would um, go to anybody's house day or night, and I would be welcomed like a long lost son. Come in, sit down, eat. And I was affirmed by every adult in the village every day from age 5 to age 13. Do you believe that? Yeah. Affirmed by every adult every day. Good boy. And you know, I, I had a mentor, an alley mentor, uh, that I had when I was age 5. And it's, it is not something that uh, we, we would appoint an Acha. You just knew who your Acha was. You see each other and you know that my Acha. And the reason for that is that words are not something that is important in an Acha relationship. Yet he taught me from, from when I was, uh, um, I had, when he had me under his wing from age 5 to age 13, he um, he taught me all I knew about what it means to be a man, what it means to be in relationship to self, to others, to creation, uh, what it means to share, uh, what it means to cooperate, all these things. And yet, from age 5 to age 13, he may have said no more than 200 words to me. Can you imagine that? Because words were considered superfluous and sometimes dangerous. And the most important thing, uh, words would try to describe them. But the most important things to self is within yourself, your feelings. And so they emphasized that. And, and so I would go out, uh, the adult's responsibility was to um, uh, create the space for young people to learn, but not tell them what they should learn. And I was never told what I should learn, nor uh, given descriptions or explanations for anything that I saw. I had to figure it out for myself. And uh, that way, the child is expected, is, uh, is allowed to be all he or she can be um, without prescription of another adult. It's quite an amazing thing. Um, so that's the background. And I'll tell you a little bit about native science. We don't use that word to describe what we know because it's in the context of everyday living that we know these things. And uh, we, we um, learn, watch, listen, and learn. And that way we make it very immediate to us. Now mind you, this, this science is, um, it has to be 100% uh, right. 100% right. Because if you think about it, if you're wrong with traditional knowledge and wisdom, then you, somebody dies or a group of people die. There's a lot at risk and at stake with this stuff. And so we take care of how 
we know things. And so we would learn things and then we would share it with the community. And the community would be, um, they would um, double check the information. It's kind of like um, scientifically, you know, I, uh, scientifically it's uh, uh, like validation or or repetition of a hypothesis to be proven to, tr to be true. Now, I've immersed myself in Western science. Um, I was an, uh, one of four Native Americans in the White House Conference on the Oceans. I uh, was the uh, chair of the um, traditional knowledge sessions of the Global Summit of Indigenous Peoples on Climate Change. I mean, I've done a committee on the Bering Sea Ecosystem. I've done a lot of things. And so uh, I, did, I did this to learn what did the science, this Western science have, have that uh, we can use and what are its, are its uh, things that it cannot do and also to compare my own ways of knowing. And there are a lot of things that, uh, that uh, we don't understand about Western science. And that is, I'm talking about everybody. Uh, for example, I was up in Chuff uh, Moose to count the ratio of bull moose to female because the population was going down and uh, uh, the chiefs listened for 45 minutes to the man explaining how they were going to do these counts and he was an earnest man and then after 45 minutes the lead chief said did you notice that the water levels in the rivers are going down and he says no hydrology is a different, different uh, discipline. You know, it's out of my league. Well, do you notice that when the water levels go down, the forage that the moose eat disappear? And he said, and the man again said, "Well, that's not my discipline. Um, we're, we're, I'm doing aerial transects only. Uh, that one should go to flora and fauna, maybe." And um, then the chief said, well, do you notice that there are a lot of uh, beaver dams in the area? More than we've ever noted before. And he says, no, he's not studying beaver. And then, you know, it's, it's a, a native way of looking at things in terms of connections. We see the connection because we live by them every day. And here they were pointing these connections out to the man. And the man, in earnest, tried to offer something. And he said, um, well, why don't you testify to this before the Board of Fish and Game, uh, uh, or Board of Game. And you could hear the silent groans <laughs> amongst the chiefs. Because native ways of knowing are considered uh, anecdotal information, interesting pieces of information that, uh, that may, may or may not be useful. And, uh, and in fact, when you look at the state laws and the federal laws, they say that public policy with regard to uh, 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 making decisions uh, uh, regarding any species has to be done uh, with the best available science. And best available science, by definition, does not include native ways of knowing. So, de facto, they are excluding this way. <clears throat> and um, i give you another example. I don't know St. Paul Island where I was born. Uh, we have all these birds. There are all kinds of birds. There are red-legged kittiwake, black-legged kittiwake, uh, pelagic comorants, red-faced comorants, uh, thick-billed birds, common murs, least oclets, crested oclets, 
uh, fulmars, and just all kinds of birds out there. And in my childhood, they were concentrated so thick uh, in the cliffs because these are migratory seabirds. And, excuse me. And uh, um, they would like to fly. They get up early in the morning and they fly in front of the bird cliffs uh, in circles, gathering members of their species before they go out foraging. And I was uh, six years old when um, I decided that I wanted to, to, to experience what the birds experienced. So I, I would go out underneath the bird cliffs all the time and just watch them. And they would fly within inches of me. And there would be a cacophony of sound, of just amazing. You, you can't imagine what that's like. And, uh, and they would fly. I noticed one day they would fly some would fly diagonally left, diagonally right, right, left, up, down, uh, and they would fly at different speeds, but yet not a single one of them birds clipped a wing. Wow! There must have been 10,000 birds underneath that bird cliff, flying uh, in every which direction, apparent chaos, and none of them clipped a wing. How they do that? <laughs> so I thought my child mind, well, birds don't think. They don't think, they just are a field of awareness. And so uh, I decided I'm, I'm gonna be a bird. And so it took me several months, but I got it. I could get to the point where I wouldn't have a single thought running through my head at all for hours. Now, think about thinking. The reason that we think is it's in the past already. It's not present at the moment. And you're thrown into the past due to guilt, shame, remorse, anger, rage, jealousy, you name it. Or into the future, projecting fear. Uh, and with something that hasn't happened yet. But every place except now, in the present moment, every place except now. And when I did it, then I felt the magic happen. In the, in the winter, in the uh, winter, fall, winter, spring, we would hunt to stellar sea lions. And uh, they are they stay only in the water. We don't hunt them in the summer because they're breeding. And so uh, it's colder in on land than it is in the water for them. So they stay in the water. So we hunt from shore to sea. And it's a 180, 180 degree uh, view of the water because we're on an island. And someone the hunter, we'd, we'd go out about uh, four or five hunters at a time, <clears throat> and I'd go out there and watch, listen, and learn. And then pretty soon someone would say, Kawa kako, sea lion coming. And they would instantly, all of them, without that man pointing or looking, look at the same spot in the water, the same spot, without talking with each other, without signaling with each other. And so I, I watch, I look, and there's no sea lion. And, and there's also on this 180 degrees expanse of water. How did they pick this one location? So I watch again, and 10 minutes later, sure enough, the sea lion pops up right there. Pretty amazing. And they never get the men never get sleepy. We would be there for nine hours or so, and I'd get sleepy by noon or something like that when we'd go out early in the morning before sunrise. <laughs> and I would get sleepy or I'd fall asleep by noon, but the men never did. But they never talked with each other. They never um, talked loudly. 
They never moved very much. They just sat, stayed there, st uh, sitting there for hour after hour. And I thought, that's magical. And then what the hunters did when they spotted the sea lion, that's magical. And then I, I get it. The connection between the birds and these men. These men were present in the moment. And when I became present in the moment, I never got sleepy again. And I could feel the sea lion before it comes, believe it or not. And I applied that to fishing. And I can tell you when a fish is exploring the bait, when it's, um, um, uh, when you hook it, if it's hooked by the lip or the jaw or the side of the body, I can tell you what size it is. I can tell you whether or not it's male or female. I can tell you how it's going to fight on the way up. I found this out uh, when I was, by the time I was 11. I compared my ways of knowing with a skipper who retired from uh, commercial fish, or not commercial fishing, the, um, and he spent 25 years sports fishing. I knew what he knew by the time I was 11. And then I, I applied it to negotiating the weather. I could, my dad gave me the boat and motor, a, a 15, 16 foot skiff with a 10 horsepower kicker and go out into the Bering Sea. We would go sometimes 10 miles off the island. And the Bering Sea, for those of you who have been to Alaska, uh, know that it's very dangerous. And in fact, they made that movie, what is that documentary called? Dangerous? Yeah. What is that color? That, 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 uh, deadly attached. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's the water we're in. Uh, but yet, uh, I could navigate. I would know, my dad knew I, I, uh, that I knew the winds, the waters, the waves, the weather, uh, uh, and even beyond that, the energy of the ocean, because each each side of the island has different energy. It's got different motion, movement, and rhythm. It's got different smells, different colors. All of these give me cues as to where I am when I'm in pea soup thick fog. And I could negotiate around the island, go 10 miles, and end up in a single rock, even with fog. That is Without the aid of any navigation instrument, uh, when the fog is so, so thick, you can only see the front of your boat. Now, well, these are not things that are inaccessible to everybody else. I'm not special in that way. Um, the, anybody can achieve these kinds of things that I'm talking about. Um, one last example. I'll give you. Um, there was a. We, we were we were wondering if we could select. Oh, oh, we surveyed the school as to what the most popular classes were, and gym was number one, <laughs> and science and math was last. And then we decided <clears throat> we're going to take three students, high school students, randomly, and ask them to volunteer to do a scientific study. And then, so we got three students. And these, we, we encourage these students to use traditional ways of knowing and the Western science approach. Uh, Fish and Wildlife had been studying seabirds out there for over 30 years. So the research methodology is very, very uh, um, made out, it's already done. And so you watch the birds, you see how many uh, birds fletch from the nest, uh, how many feeding trips they take, all these kinds of things, and, and we'd write them down. And then the Aleut way of doing it is to just watch. 
and use your observation skills because all the kids have these observation skills by the time they get kindergarten. So we, we, we uh, encourage them to do that. Well, when they finished their final report, they did it without very much help from us. And we, we turned this report in to the regional director for Fish and Wildlife Service and asked him to comment. Well, he came back to us three, three weeks later and said, this is the best graduate level work we have ever seen. Who did it? And when we told them, his high school students, it was just unbelievable. Because what it, what it resulted in what their observation did was revamp all of Fish and Wildlife Service's ways of doing research on islands like this because they, they noticed, that the, the kids noticed that grass was growing in areas around the cliffs where there used to be birds. <laughs> and the, the Fish and Wildlife Service, with their plots, they have these square plots they mark out, uh, every year, noting whether or not birds fledge and, and how many eggs they have, that kind of thing. And they forgot or ignored the fact that cliff ledges change with, with water coming between the, the cracks and wintertime hitting, the, the rocks would break open and they would fall, the cliffs would, would the, the ledge would no longer be there. And these kids pointed it out. Whoa, that was a big revelation to Fish and Wildlife Service. They revamped their whole national policy because of that. And then we, um, we went back to the school and asked the, the biology teacher to um, apply this visual math, and he did. And because of that, St. Paul Island was selected as one of two places in the U.S. to test out a visual math course. Um, and then their performance went off the scale, it just went totally off the scale, because they were utilizing their familiar, their, their familiar ways of knowing Plus, they were using local, observing local wildlife instead of importing salamanders from Wisconsin to study biology. They were. <laughs> and uh, then we resurveyed the school again. Jim was still number one. <laughs> and, uh, but science and math was number two. It's quite amazing. So in, uh, in closing, I would like to say um, that this native ways of knowing to provide an early warning system to the scientists that are doing studies out there. They can notice uh, things that are happening um, long before scientists do because the scientists don't like to study in the winter time. <laughs> it's really too bad. <laughs> And then they have five-year time series data if they're lucky. You know, they, they get these data that they put in a time series. Uh, a good scientific project would go 10 years, but most are limited to five years if that. And uh, so our knowing and observing every day of every year plus storytelling passed along from generation to generation gives us a pretty good idea of what things looked like before. And so it would put context to the time series data that they have for a fixed period of time uh, in the past. We could, we could uh, notice them in the past. And we can um, um, uh, help, help hone in the hypothesis that scientists are working on as to why things are the way they are. And uh, an example was that the Fish and Water, our, our National Marine Fishery Service was studying fur seals and why they were declining. And uh, we had already known that because of adult birds with breast bones sticking out, chest muscles caved in, 
uh, uh, chicks with that were too weak to maintain their hole in cliff ledges, dying by the thousand. Sea lion chasing after seal pups in greater frequency than ever in living memory. And we take uh, uh, the fat off the seal pelt and you point it up to the light and we saw the light through it. We never saw that before. So we knew there was an ecosystem-wide phenomena that was occurring out there, but the scientists didn't believe us. And it, it took 10 years of research on first seal to determine that the high seas uh, drift nets were not the reason for the fur seals dying. It was because of ecosystem-wide phenomena. So uh, they can save a lot of money if they listen to us. And not only that, uh, University of California commissioned a study, $300,000 study, to determine whether or not halibut f uh, feed off the bottom. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I knew that information when I was six. <laughs> because we, we'd catch halibut all the way to the top of the water. And, uh, and they had to do a $300,000 study. Anyway, there's lots of ways that uh, uh, this science can benefit from our science. Thank you. Thank you. This is for questions. Any questions? Yes. You know, you talk about people, yourself, going fishing. You can't see anything. You know the fish is there. People knowing the weather, people knowing where the land is in the flood. Are these, these are things in our culture we consider psychic. Are they psychic or are they actually literally observing physical things or is it a combination of the two? Talk more about this experience. It's well, it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's the way of the human being, the real human being we call it. The real human being has the use of the, all the God-given gifts of the uh, human being, not just the brain. The elders say uh, we reversed every, everything, uh, so they call us the inside out or the reverse society. And, and one of the reversals is the heart used to tell the mind what to do, and now the mind tells the heart what to do. And that's what's causing the problems we have in the world today. I mean, Einstein said, you can't solve the problem with the same consciousness that created the problem. Right. right. And that consciousness is head-centered. And so, uh, we all have these abilities if we would just get into the heart. That's a good question. Yes. Can you tell me how um, how your your sensing, your knowledge without communication? How I mean, it, does it does it require you to be in the environment where you grew up, or could you go to somewhere else and um, have more knowledge than other people because of things? Well, when you think about it, um, and this is all about relationship. Relationship to self, to others, to the world. And uh, the elders say that uh, nothing is created outside until it's created inside first. And uh, we trash the environment on the outside because we're trashing the inside. We're uh, 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 criticizing people because we're criticizing ourselves. We're judging others because we judge ourselves. And, and these are just reversals that need to be reversed again. Uh, but uh, these are ways that uh, are applicable anywhere once you get them. Yes, sir. I'm wondering why would you say that European science can be so hard of listening? Is it just simple prejudice, or is there something deeper than the whole way the whole outlook? Well, um, I, I studied this issue with, with Russian scientists because we couldn't get American scientists to look at these issues. <laughs> and we wanted to see what the patterns were in the scientific systems all over the world. And we found lots of different uh, parallels 
in, in the, and uh, there are lots of reasons why this isn't so. The universities, for example, they don't train you to look at different things other than the way that they train you to learn. And then um, uh, the professionals themselves, they depend upon this stuff for, for a living. And so they don't want to risk going outside of this thing because the system supports um, uh, this particular way. And if you deviate from it too much, you're out. I know three scientists that got their heads chopped off because they uh, did something that the science didn't condone, even though I thought they were really good scientists. Um, and you take a scientist out of their field, they're like babes in the woods. And so uh, you need all these things in the system to change before that science uh, changes. Was Steiner going home? And when you talked about migratory birds, did you ever you see um, yellow billed loons out there? And can you talk about the difference be before the Exxon Valdez and after? Well, the Exxon Valdez uh, occurred in, in you know, down in Prince William South, so uh, but, but it did affect some in our populations out in Purple Off Island. Um, Steiner. He, uh, of course, was focused on uh, the Prince William Sound area. And uh, so he and I would encounter each other occasionally. But uh, he, did his, he did his thing, and we did a horse. And the yellow-billed loon? Uh, yellow-billed loon, uh, we saw them occasionally. Yes? What's some of the good examples of your own experience, but are there other good examples in Alaska of integrating Native science into training of future scientists here? Up at UAM. Uh, well, uh, let, let's put, there is one good example, and that's the Eskimo Whaling Commission, mm -hmm. where they have, um, they didn't, co they did, the Eskimo people did not allow their knowledge and ways of knowing to be co-opted by the Western science. What they did was uh, develop their, poly their, their uh, system side by side with the Western scientists, and they would intersect on occasion. That works, but, but uh, very few examples anywhere else, unfortunately. Um, 
well, now you know the human mind, how intractable it can get. And that uh, includes all of us. Uh, what I, I do now, I find the most effective, is meet the people where they're at. And then so, slowly start introducing new things. Uh, but very slowly. Because, uh, well, the fact that you're in science, number one, is, is uh, a challenge. Number two, it's uh, more of a challenge because you're a woman. And uh, as much as I hate to say that, uh, it is still a male-dominated way, although it's slowly changing. Uh, we, you know, I was thinking about this uh, woman scientist who um, studied why uh, women uh, menstruate. Uh, up until that point, men uh, did the studies and the men would say, you know, it's to flush everything out of the body. But when the woman did it, she found out that the women menstruate primarily to eject bacteria interjected by men. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you guys, you got to admit, uh, that's something that you don't want to admit. It's true. Uh, so it does make a difference what perspective you're using. Uh, but, uh, but also I would say just start with, uh, start simple. Start where people, where people are. And so, 
Uh, that's what I'm focused on now. Uh, the elder said, stop trying to save the Bering Sea and work at uh, helping the young people prepare for what's coming. Because what's coming is hard. Yes. Um, I've been thinking about, I've been involved with several scientific projects, and I've been thinking about how there might be a way to uh, uh, incorporate more indigenous knowledge into examination of whatever the problem is. <coughs> and this sounds very simple, but it probably never happened. But I'm wondering, you know, in most environmental impact statements, it's broken into different sections, like economic and social economic and natural sciences, trees and flowers. Now, I'm wondering if it would be helpful if we just had a section called indigenous knowledge. <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think that it would be a good thing. Uh, it would be called traditional knowledge and wisdom. Um, and so that would help. But the other part is you must begin to realize that uh, incorporating in another person's or another people's ways into your way doesn't work. What you need is side-by-side -side partnerships. And by doing that, we have, uh, both sides have so much to offer. And uh, we can really do some, some good. Do you say that because if you do it, if you incorporate one into the other, one becomes subordinated? And yes, because, because the, the Western way is to look at nature or ecosystems or whatever it is and and refine it down to a single piece. It's taking out the part from the whole. The native way is synergistically looking at the whole and not going to the part. So uh, they, they are two distinct different ways, but they can work together. Yes, sir. No, I already knew. Um, I, I, oh yes, there were definitely lots of obstacles. I mean, uh, to, to, to delve into Western science, for example, took me 25 years of struggle to understand it. I mean, starting from college, where I, I, I took zoology and funked it. That was the first course I took in science um, because I couldn't understand how understanding the pieces would mean anything. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey, but a good one. Yes, sir. I'm curious, I know that the people in the Bering Sea area are very concerned about global warming because a lot of communities may be flooded out. But what else about global warming are native people and survival of cultures and food systems? What are the possible threats to the yes. way of life and global warming? Well, uh, yes. For example, in the Bering Sea, there are now over uh, 20 species, higher trophic species in a state of severe and catastrophic decline. And that's just one example. Uh, salmon, for example. Yes, no question. Salmon, for example. I listened to an elder, Paul John, talk, he's a Yupik elder talk about what he knows about salmon and how he knows it for, for an hour in front of a group of officials and I could see it went over their heads because he was talking about how he would watch the wind every day, how he'd watch the waves and how big they are and how frequently they came in. Uh, he watched the forage next to rivers, all these kinds of things and, and he said, our way are predicting is 100% accurate, he says. He's, he's an old man now, he's 80 something. It's 100% accurate a year from now. Your way, he said, he was talking to these officials, 
So this is not accurate at all, to the point that salmon will very well disappear from Alaska one day. And, uh, and they, the, the scientists got too defensive, I guess. And they didn't listen to what he was saying. Uh, so uh, there's a lot at stake. Uh, salmon, uh, uh, the river levels in the major rivers of Alaska, Kuskokwim, Yukon, Copper River, they're going down to the point where some parts are so narrow or thin that the fish swimming up it get lesions. Now, 40% uh, of the, the fish in Yukon got these lesions on them. Uh, there, um, there is a parasite in the Bering Sea that is that is that is uh, uh, really robust now because of the temperature change in the ocean, and so they're attacking the salmon. And now the salmon are showing up with more and more of these. Uh, uh, the effects of the parasites. One effect is a woman showed me and uh, hung uh, the salmon strips up like you see in pictures. But then she said, come, look at this. And she tugs on the meat and it falls off. Mm -hmm. And he said the color of the fish is also wrong. That's happening. And then you have front end loading of uh, ice pack in the mountains that are melting faster than ever before. And, and so what they do is uh, the, the, the water levels go, they're huge in the very beginning of a springtime. And, and uh, instead of going flowing out uh, normally at an even level all, all summer long, they're flowing out much of it at the very beginning. And so, um, a lot of the rivers are going down because of that. And then you have beavers, beaver grazed giardia. And their beaver dams, they're proliferating all across Alaska now, uh, when it never did before. In fact, we have beavers above the Arctic Circle. That never happened before. Uh, and, and so the beaver dam, beavers are um, creating dams that are lowering the water levels and creating giardia that is bad for salmon eggs. And so uh, the salmon are going down. Uh, now you may have some years when they, then they're up, but the trend is downward. So he may be right, they, they may be disappearing. Does the use pollock fishery have an effect on your life out there? Yes. It's having acid something. Yeah, they call the pollock fishery uh, of the U.S. the best example of well-managed fishery in the world. But no, it's not, because they're ignoring half of the Bering Sea, which is owned by, uh, most of it, uh, owned by the Russians. And, yet, and we know what the Russians are doing. Uh, and we know that the Bering Sea is a counterclockwise gyre. It goes in, it's the third most closed water body in the world. Third only to the Mediterranean Sea, South China Sea. And because of that, uh, uh, the, the fingerlings for the bottom fish that they're taking move in, in this counterclockwise direction so that by age one, before age one, they hit northwest of the Pribilof Islands 70 miles uh, during the summer months, exactly when the animals need it. But now that's being harmed. So yes, there is overfishing. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm wow. giving you a guess. I was curious what kind of advice you might have for, for young people coming up in uh, that, uh, that have traditional knowledge and also dabble in, in dominant society knowledge. And uh, uh, you speak to that. Bipolar, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, in fact, most of in, my... In, in the context of, of uh, science today. Most of my um, uh, talks are given to youth, uh, starting from kindergarten on up, and uh, a lot through college students. Uh, 
And what I tell them in a very gentle way is that you need to look to your heart that the society is telling you your mind is the one that is in control and is the seat of intelligence, but it's not. The mind always lies and twists things and makes you uncertain and makes you have doubts. But when you come, when you can hear the voice in your heart, it will be undeniable, it will be unequivocal, it will, it will guide you right. Uh, it guides you impeccably perfect. And start from there. And then once you start from there, the answers will come. Because if your heart is telling you that you've got to do one thing, then your mind will tell you how to do it. Not the other way around. That's where we're going wrong. Okay. Thank you.